Glad to be here and also, uh, just like some of the previous speakers, I'd like to start a little philosophical and ask you a question. Why are you here? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a kind of interesting question. I ask myself that uh, sometimes, you know, why am I here? Um, and I, I, I believe a lot in Buddhism and I, this is a really good Buddhist, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, is this, where you go, that's where you are. And that could sort of be a good start. But still, why are you here? And uh, what, what is all common uh, to, to what we're doing? You could say, I'm here because I like to learn about uh, flow and porous media or uncertainty quantification, like to listen to great speakers and uh, interact with students. But I think commonly, uh, over my career, I've done the same thing. I you know, go to technical things, and after a while, you start to ask, you go to a few midlife crises, and you ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? And I think, why are we here? is because we care about our planet. That we'd like to start to understand the challenges of our time. And the challenge of our time is very simple. We are going to be with 10 billion people in a decade or two. And so how do we do that? And so then people ask sometimes, what gets you out of bed? And I ask myself, well, how can I contribute to that very difficult question? That's a challenge of our times. In that sense, these three things, or four things, are going to be very important. Food, water, energy, and materials. And so you are working in, in, in sort of this area here, a little bit of lots of water, maybe a little bit of energy. Uh, I will talk also about materials, right? Materials are, are things, earth resources, uh, in a sense, are very important. Iron, copper, rare earth element. Just look at your phone and what's inside. So uh, recently, actually just three weeks ago, uh, we published this book uh, with my group, and I'd like to acknowledge my PhD student, Louis Lee, and my senior research engineer, Celine Scheid, uh, on this on uncertainty in uh, subsurface systems, and particularly addressing the issue of dealing with uncertainties related to these very important uh, resources. I, I don't work on food, but I do work on uh, groundwater management, geothermal energy, uh, minerals, storage, and other uh, type of things. And so uncertainty, obviously, is the big question. Uh, uncertainty of where we're going with this planet, how many resources there are, how we would get them out of the ground. And in doing that, we always have to have, to have a, a, a sort of a problem, which is the resource <coughs> versus the environment. Uh, we are going to need these, but many of those in their extractions, also water, uh, mining, of course, oil and gas, of course, even geothermal, there's going to be a footprint. And so that's why uh, what Ty was talking about, you're going to have many stakeholders. Stakeholders that are on this side and stakeholders that are on this side. And so there's this question of risk versus return. And so the only way to access this is through uncertainty quantification. So what is this Bayesian evidential learning? So uh, I took this name, obviously, because I'm from Belgium, so that's the number one reason. <laughs> The first thing is Bayesianism. So Bayesianism uh, should not be confused with Bayes' rule. So Bayes, Bayesianism is only 50 years old. It's a, it's a way of thinking about science uh, that re relies on the fundamental notion of prior uncertainty or prior knowledge. So Bayes was, a, as you may know, is a reverend living in the 18th century. He didn't actually write Bayes' rule, but he came up with this idea is that before you start a problem, there's always knowledge before that. There's, you don't start from zero. You never, you, in other words, you rarely start from a uniform distribution. There's always knowledge, right? And this is how science uh, works. It's also yet a little bit unclear what Bayesianism really is. It's still an evolving uh, uh, philosophy of science. But I would, uh, I would say that's a combination of inductive and deductive reasoning, and I will, I will point that out at several uh, stages. It's evidential because we're going to rely, obviously, in, in uncertainty quantification on evidence. And I, I don't, and I, uh, Nicholas said it very well, you don't have to make a distinction in terms of evidence between data and model. I don't, I don't like that distinction too much. I feel like both data and model are providing us evidence. And so the question is, uh, what do we do with this evidence? And then comes the, the big computational problem, right? Because this is all nice and we can formulate this uh, and we can uh, set up our, our protocol but there's going to be a computational component. And so uh, in order to make this work for real life problems, and I will show you several of those, there are enormous challenges. But luckily, uh, these days, we can rely on powerful machine learning. And so machine learning has come up recently, 
as a, a sort of a sidestep from statistics where you can start to build very complex relationship between very high dimensional properties. Monte Carlo uh, is going to be the key component as well for that. Okay, so there are six, six stages. I'll go through the stages. They have a nice color attached to it so you can really follow how things are going. So decision making is what we're going to look at, right? It's like what Ty said, if you're going to have an impact in the real world, it's not about understanding science only, it's also about the decisions that are being made. You're going to drill a well and that's going to happen. It's an action that you're going to take. So we have to formulate that decision question and thereby stating the important prediction variables. The second stage is called, this is a, a difficult one for most people, it's a mathematical stage where you say, okay, I'm going to first conceptualize the problem and in conceptualizing the problem I need to understand a little bit or I need to state what is called model complexity, how big are the models I'm going to make. Fine, we talked about grid, we talked about number of parameters, do I have a deltaic system, do I add faults, and all these complexities that are there. And some initial understanding on, on the uncertainty uh, that is there. So this is a mathematical step, it's an abstraction of our world. Then comes a very important deductive part of this. This is all, this is inductive, this is now deductive. Uh, it was already a couple times mentioned that the best thing to do in science is to di try to disprove yourself, right? Because you could say, yeah, that looks nice, but the first thing we'd like to go do is through Monte Carlo do what is called falsification. Falsification is trying to prove what you just said wrong. Um, why do we do it that way? I'll come now back to that because in probability theory or with probabilities you can never prove them right. So the only thing you can do is prove them wrong. And so we'll have to go through methods that do that. So falsification methods. And that's where you would use, of course, observations. Once you've done that and your prior is not falsified, then you have something to work with that looks reasonable. And so what we're going to then do is to understand our problem better. And that is called global sensitivity analysis. It's a Monte Carlo based sensitivity analysis where we're going to try to understand what really matters in this decision problem. You see, I don't start with building a model that matches data. That comes actually way, way at the end. The reason for that is that that's very difficult to do. So if I can then focus on those variables that are important, then I can ask the question, what data is informing those variables? So I'm not necessarily going to say I'm going to use all the data to build the models. No, I'm going to first figure out what's important and then say what data can I use to constrain. And then comes the constraining. You see my, my, my so-called inverse problem sits, sits really, really low. And the reason for that is that once I arrive here, I have, I have already verified a lot of things that are going on and I've simplified my problem. And I can do inversion very quickly. You'll see that that's now actually a matter of seconds not days or hours. It's already done. And then of course there's also posterior falsification. We're not going to talk about that too much. Uh, in other words, you will get a posterior uncertainty and you have to now check whether that's also correct or not according to your principles. Okay, I'll walk through this in this book. There are five real case studies in geothermal, groundwater, oil and gas, shale gas uh, and, and contamination. And so I'll walk through some of these uh, problems just to illustrate some of the points. So the first thing we'll do is formulate a decision question. So here we are in, in, in Denmark, uh, groundwater management problem, and the question is very simple. Uh, we have a well in a location uh, that is, seems to be draining wetlands and uh, rivers. We don't like that. So we'd like to re relocate that well field to any of these four locations. So the question now is you sort of predetermined. Uh, here's the Denmark, uh, here's the city of Aarhus. So we're close there, and this is a small area of about five kilometers. So the question is very simple. In the end, after all what you're doing, multiphase flow, reactive transport, geophysics, hydrogeophysics, you're going to say A, B, C, or D. That's the end. So how do we get there? Do I need to do all the stuff that we're doing in this workshop in order to get there? And what is it that I'm doing in this workshop that I need to do to get there? And I think you should not use this track of that. In Denmark, they have really nice uh, sky temp data, and so you get these uh, uh, they have buried valleys, they're glaciated valleys that are filled with gravel, it's very heterogeneous. So just putting it based on some simple hydrological model has failed in Denmark. They've tried it, it did not work. So you have to include the heterogeneity in some sense. 
So the, this question could be, this stage could be, what problem do I want to address and what would it take to solve it? Well, if you're doing decision uh, uh, questions, then you have to also come up with some objectives, right? And you may have many stakeholders in, up, in the formulating those objectives. Some people may be worried about contamination, right? The stakeholder that looks at this objective says, I'm worried about contamination because if I put the well there and I drain, I draw down, then I can draw down uh, agricultural pollution. Uh, but of course, the people that, uh, that are, need to drink water, they also need to make sure that you don't get too much drawdown because then uh, you will not get your extraction that you would require. So these objectives, as you notice, they always start with a, with a word, a verb called minimize or maximize. And without that objective, we're going to associate some key decision variables. I'm not going to go over those in great detail, but you can imagine that um, here, for example, contamination is calculated by the drainage area uh, that is connecting to the areas that have industry and the areas that have uh, agriculture. But of course, that drainage area, indus and farm, is not known. We'd like to know those uncertainties, right? If they were known, then the problem was solved. So, what I want to get is this is what I want to get. I want to know for all these four locations, how do well do I perform on all these objectives? The problem, of course, is that there are risk objectives and return objectives. This is uh, a risk objective, right? It may cause pollution. And then I have a return objective, which is I can get the drawdown uh, not too low. So you see this resource versus the environment, even in groundwater management in Denmark. Okay, statement of model complexity and prior uncertainty. So, I'm a mathematician, so the way I think is, if you are starting a problem, you have to define variables, and you have to define the problem. And a, a lot of the confusion that comes in, I'll talk about that a little bit, is names. People use different names. Invert, calibrate, update. So we have to define things. So the first thing we do is we conceptualize Earth Right? in all its aspects. What we're not going to do is cut stuff up into little cages, the silos. You work on the hydro problem, and you work on that problem, and you work on that problem. Earth is not like that. Earth is not based on geological fields of, or, or fields of science. Earth is Earth. And what do we already know about stuff? There's already a lot known. Right? Maybe you don't know it, but other people know it. So often when, people, when, when students work with me on uncertainty quantification, I have to go say, well, maybe you, go to, you may be able to talk to that person, the geochemist, or maybe you go talk to the sedimentologist, and they have their literature, and they have stuff that, 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 you, that they know that you don't know. Okay, so that would mean, essentially, you have to define what's called model complexity, right? How complicated do you want your model to be? This is, you start with this, and then you want to know what is uncertainty on that model? And so this needs to be defined for all the fields together. So if you're doing subsurface modeling, there's lots of stuff uh, involved. Here at this stage, don't be too worried. I would say don't be afraid to be uncertain. The problem often is that we don't like uncertainty and we like to resolve it right away. That's the danger. Don't be afraid to be uncertain. That comes another stage which is called falsification that's going to check what you're doing. Uh, and so often, my experience with all the case studies, people are not uncertain enough, despite the fact that they think they're too uncertain. That's a very common problem. Okay? So let's look at some examples. Here is the largest oil field in Europe. Do you know where that is? It's in Austria. It's, uh, I know. Who, t who would know, right? Austria. It's like four million people live there. Uh, so here we have a gigantic oil field that's 700 meters thick. It's like 50 kilometers long. It has been in production for 60 years, and it has hundreds and hundreds of wells. These are not mosquitoes, they're wells. So you see oil companies, they have a lot of data. And they have a lot of uncertainty. So I work with this company and says, let's just list the uncertainties. Don't worry, right? Let's just list them. Variogram, training image, porosity, permeability, anything to do with geophysics, anything to do with geology. This is a summary. This is just a few of the many. Then there's another list, which has to do with flow and transport, relative permeability, uh, PVT properties of oil and gas and water, 
etc., etc. And the list goes on and on and on. Don't be afraid to be uncertain. Let's make the list. Let's come up with some initial prior distributions that are pretty wide. We're not, we're not worried at this point about being too overly accurate because that's the killer. What's also very important is that all these sources need to be joined, need to be considered jointly. You can't just say, I'm going to focus first, first on this part and then I'll focus on that part. No, because the flow you get out of the system is, is function of everything. It's not function of just geology at one component and geophysics. You can't differentiate them. I mean, in a nonlinear complicated system, uh, in system analysis, we know that everything is interacting all the time in order to produce responses. So in groundwater, and this is back to Denmark, uh, you see that we have a lot of stuff, right? These are actually boxes that are fields. You may be, uh, somebody talked today, uh, I think it's really about river flow and conductance. That's one box, right? And then you have, uh, somebody talked today about uh, hydraulic um, gradients. That's one box. Then you have things about uh, permeability or hydraulic connectivity. Uh, you don't know how much it rains, that we talked about that too. So, so you have uh, recharge. So there's all these, ac all these fields of science involved uh, that are needing to come up with these uncertainties. Okay, so now comes a big step, which is, so we, we're done with blue and we go to, we go to green. And in order to, to do that, I'm going to just make it a little simpler. It looks complicated, but it isn't. Okay, so there's basically three things involved, the three variables that are involved. The first variable is the, what's called the variable M, which is your modeling. We talked about that. You're going to build models. We'll talk about that. Then there's data. So we have, this is not data. These are data variables. I'm a mathematician, so what I do is I define a variable, which is called the data variables, not the observations. The observation I'll call DOPS. Right? And as uh, Fred just said, is the link between this is some kind of forward model. And then there is the prediction variable. I'm going to call that H. This, this is my key prediction variable. This is what I like to have. Right? So there's this triangle here. So let's do an analogy. Let's say that you're coming in this room, right? You just, you were, it was empty, people were coming in, and let's call M people. You're a complex, right? You're made up of stuff, blood vessels, brain, complicated. Then I'd like to ask from you some information, which is, what's your hair color? Uh, where are you from? Uh, how tall are you? How much weight? What's your weight? Uh, you know, have you played soccer in your life? Blah, blah, blah. There's a couple of data. That's much less dimension. You would agree. Right? And then, I'm, and, and then I'll do, what I'll do with you is I'll have you do soccer tests. Right? I'm trying to be into the, the realm. I say, I'm having you do penalty kicks, and then I do headers. And, uh, and I was really bad at soccer, but my dad <laughs> took me to soccer. I hated it. <laughs> Headers, etc. So what is Monte Carlo? Monte Carlo is basically people coming in. M's. Then from those people, I get data. I just ask. Right? So in our world, they're basically doing an action on the earth, which is collecting a measurement. And then I, I'm not interested in the data, I'm interested in something, which is this over here. That's called H. Okay, so in the end, I'm interested in the uncertainty on H. I'm not interested in uncertainty on M. That's very important. So, this is what that slide says. There are many persons like that. So now imagine a new person comes in, right? And I ask him all these things, but I have no time to do any soccer tests. How can I reduce the uncertainty of, or the risk of, say, hiring that person in my team being a defender? That's the problem we're trying to solve. Okay, so. As I said, the modeling world is complicated. So all companies, they, they're really good at this, right? They build uh, structural models and facious models and sedimentological models and, and then training images and realizations of porosity, permeability, that's huge, right? And, and other permeability, porosity relationships, relative permeability relationships, they do Monte Carlo. And they generate, based on the Monte Carlo, they're going to now say, okay, 
I'm going to generate now the D, which is my observations. These are all the gray things. These are all wells with rates of oil and gas. And I'm also going to generate what's the future, which I would like to know in this field, what is the decline of oil rate over the next 10 years? So this is the past. This is the future. This is the future. Sorry. <laughs> this is the past and this is the present. All right? We're not interested in the past or the present. We're interested in the future because that's where risk lies. Okay. Some math. I love math, but also as a mathematician, I'm a little wary of showing too many equations. But this, I think, is, is, is a really important one. Dimension reduction. So how does that work, dimension reduction, and what is that really? So imagine I have something very high dimensional. For example, Reed was talking yesterday about 30 million dimensions, right? So my model, this X could be a model or a prediction or a data. How can I make that smaller dimensional? Well, the trick that's been around for a very long time is to do this, is to do a decomposition and say, I have some functions or functionals, or I call it actually shapes, geometries, because this could be in high dimension, and something that has variance. So these are fixed and these are varying. A very good example that you already know is Fourier transformations and Fourier decomposition, right? You take cosine sines and you would have that. So why are these shapes? Well, this is a shape, right? I mean, if you think about a function, that's a shape. If you think about a 2D geological map, that's a shape. 3D volume, that's a shape. So you take fixed shapes. For example, here I have something. I'm not saying what this is. It could be Ed's, uh, Fred's uh, inversion uh, result. It could be a permeability model. It could be whatever. I can always write that exactly in this form. So I can write that as a linear combination of this picture, which see the shape is simple, right? This picture, which seems to be indicating some gradient. This picture, gradient in the other direction, and so on, and so on, and so on. Machine learning is essentially methods to discover these shapes. What are these shapes? The simplest machine learning method is principal component analysis, which is what this is here. But it doesn't have to be as simple as this. It could be much more complicated. And then I can plot that as, uh, as, as scores. Okay, you can do this for reactive transport model. We worked on the rifle side in, in, uh, in, uh, Den in, Dem in Colorado. And so what you're doing here in a course is running crunch flow, right? And so I can take a crunch flow run and there's a lot of uncertainties, right? Geochemical uncertainties, geological uncertainties to create all these. And I can write this crunch for result here as if I use 10 of these alphas, not too good. But when I use 100 alphas, pretty good. So what I have done is I've taken this complicated image and reduced it to 100 scalar values. Okay, falsification. So now we have to worry, right? Because I've done all the stuff, I generated all these things, right? These observations here. Now I worry about, okay, can my model, and I type, uh, talked about it, can my model actually predict observations? That's the falsification. So the falsification is saying, if I would take all my, in, this, in the Danish case, I would take all my pumping data, so these are head data, these dots, I take my stream flow data, I take tracer data, I take all this data, and I put it in this low dimensional space, which is done here, right? And then I can also map in this low dimensional space my observations, right? And see, this is 68% of variance, this is 14% of variance, so that's a lot of variance. And you notice that, yes, my model can predict my observations. So your model is not falsified. And I want to stress the language here. Your model is not calibrated or validated or verified or any of those. You cannot say any of those. Don't use that language. The only thing you could say is falsification makes your hypothesis stronger. 
I'm just making a hypothesis. I'm a mathematician. I make a hypothesis. I test my hypothesis. I have the hypothesis testing show that it's not falsified. Now I have a stronger hypothesis. That's the only thing. What if it is falsified? What if my data was over here? Well, a lot of people don't do is try to move the cloud over there. <laughs> right? And then the next time the data is over there. Do you remember the cloud over there? That's called ensemble common filtering. <laughs> right? Don't do that. Oops. Pressed some kind of a button. Yeah. What should happen? Three things could happen. Your model wasn't complex enough. Your model wasn't uncertain enough. Or both but you don't know what. So you have to go and what's called revision. You have to go back and say, hey, geologist, what's going on here? Don't have enough uncertainty. What's going on? Oh, well, the other geologist said that it was, it was a fluvial, but I, I took it as deltaic. Well, then you put in this uncertainty. You say, we don't know whether it's fluvial or deltaic, and we move forward, and then suddenly we may see our cloud is, is, is increasing. Sensitivity analysis is very important. Uh, sensitivity analysis is a learning stage. We're doing what is called Monte Carlo-based or global sensitivity analysis. What you should never do is this one-at-a-time analysis. Don't ever do that in uncertainty quantification. That means I fix a parameter and I change other parameters. Or I fix this bunch of parameters and change those parameters. That doesn't give you any insight in a nonlinear system. In a nonlinear, non-Gaussian system, all parameters are interacting to create the response. So we're going to fix things then you're getting the wrong results. And that has been sh shown time after time with case studies. That the sensitivities you calculate are dead wrong. And we have in the book published several cases where you show that the one at a time analysis are completely incorrect for a problem where you know what the sensitivities are. Sensitivity analysis, the first thing you have to do is learn what matters for your prediction. In other words, what in this M here is, you don't have to put it on, it's fine. Uh, what is impacting age? What? Not everything. Right? Once I know that, then I can look for what, what in the M is being informed by M. That doesn't require an inversion, it requires a sensitivity analysis. Okay, here's an example, for example, in, in the Danish case. This is a sensitivity analysis to our data. So remember, we have all this tracer data, head data, streamfold data. Right? And we do a sensitivity analysis. You see, we have a gigantic number of parameters. But hey, there's only a few here that are important. Which ones? Boundary conditions. These are all to do with the flux in, into the domain. What's not important is hydraulic connectivity or geological heterogeneity. So if you would now say, I'm going to do solve an inverse problem and take my head data and invert for hydraulic connectivity, you were doing the absolutely wrong thing. You should never do that if you see this. Yeah? Um, the relative importance, uh, it's, it means yeah. everything relates to one? Oh, uh, no, no. No, th that's, this is actually based on a machine learning, and I can, can show you what that actually means, but that will require. Well, you see that the relative importance, I mean, you, it's all relative, right? So this bar is gigantic, yeah. right? And this bar is very little. Fine. So there's no argument. Well, so there is a measure that has an interpretation, yeah. right? And it's a least square fitting when you split a, a classification and regression tree into it. So see what I mean? Uh, this is in the shape, yeah, that's right, yeah. So, good, good, very nice. <laughs> um, when you look at, for example, a prediction variable, I want, I want to predict how much interstitial pollution I'm going to get pumping there, then all of a sudden, what you notice is geological heterogeneity is important. Makes sense, right? Transport, right? And boundary conditions are important too. So, good, there's at least good news. The good news is that this is somewhat informative about that. Right, but not fully. Okay. Then comes now, having understood that, now the question is, okay, I want to reduce uncertainty on key prediction variables. How do I do that? Well, the classical method is inversion, inverse modeling. 
But notice all the uncertainties, uncertainty in boundary condition in the interpretation because they have these very complicated glaciated valleys. There is uncertainty in that information here. That's what Rhett was alluding to in that inversion. There's stream flow models, there's rock physics models, there's vector transport models, there's biogeochemical models. Everything is uncertain. So you can't do inverse modeling. It's not going to work. So you have to do something else. Here's a good strategy. It's worked for centuries, basically, or at least decades in science. If you have a difficult problem, problem transform in a problem you know, and then transform it back. Right? So we take a very complicated problem, we call that nonlinear Gaussian, and we transform it to linear Gaussian. Then we predict with linear Gaussian, and then we transfer back. In doing this, this is a statistical solution. So linear Gaussian is a very known, actually, you, you wrote the equation on the board. Linear Gaussian, the same equation that was used, right, y. So this will now be d, and this will be h. So I directly regress data into prediction. I don't worry about the model. And then I transform back. So how does that work? A little massy here, but I think it's real cool math. So on this side, remember you have your, your one thing, your x. Say, for example, this is your geophysical data. So I've, done, I've run my Monte Carlo. I have many geophysical realizations. Uh, and I can create my shapes in that space. Then here on this side, I have my prediction variables. Could be, for example, uh, some rate over time in the future. That's not a shape, right? And I have this guy for that. So what I want to know now is do another transformation, linear transformation, we like linear, and we try to find out the linear combinations in this space that correlate most with the linear combination in that space. In other words, I try to minimize the angle between these two vectors. So that's a linear problem. Again, a linear problem. This was a linear problem. Now I have another linear problem. So how does that work? We take all this uh, information and we turn it into these numbers. So now I've taken all that stuff and I have green observations and that. Same for that. This is for the rifle side. We have tracer observations, acetate, oh, felt complicated, complicated, complicated. Let's turn it into the simple problem. And then we do regression. So here is the alpha. This is basically, on this axis is my data. On this axis is the spatial distribution of uranium. And then I do back transformation. And you see that I get uh, my concentrations of immobilized uranium. And that's what I'd like to know. And so in the rifle side, you notice that this remediation is ineffective because it leaves big spots open where there is no precipitation and has to do with the geological heterogeneity creating these fingerings. And it's in every single model you see that this pick, there's a patch here in the middle. So we have done no inversion. It's just the machine learning statistical computation of turning data into predictions. Okay, I'm going to skip over that and wrap up a little bit with real cool stuff. So I was thinking, you know, um, I would see young people a lot on their phones and stuff, and I had like no phone when I was a kid, right? We, we actually call on the, the thing with the cord. So <laughs> I'm going to warn you, in 20 years, your kids will say, gosh, they were looking at the phone things and the desktop, because what kids do now are very interested in is immersive reality or virtual reality. And so, one thing I disagree a little bit with Ty is that I would put all the stakeholders in an immersive reality system and have them look at stuff. You see, for example, here is the copper case. What you're looking at is a movie of the uncertainty. In other words, I would tell you, you should never look at an image that you, do, that you don't know is certain because there's always this cognitive bias. So what we are trying to do with people is have them look at things that are moving and have people be involved 
here. Uh, see that I can get that going again. In sort of a collaboration, you see here that's the same thing over there, where you see this is moving, right? And so this could be your geologist, and you're here, see this is me, this is the, I don't know who that is, the data scientist. And you can then start looking at something that's, that is actually moving. You, in other words, you're not looking at something that you think is real, because that's a problem when you look at a desktop. Right? So that's sort of something that we're working on. OK, that's it. Uh, so the book is, is, is there. Uh, I also have about 100 YouTube videos. Um, they have to do here with quantifying on certain sort of systems, other kind of material. Uh, and so you'll find that uh, on YouTube. Uh, there's also uh, our, this is, of course, I want to acknowledge all my students that are working on this. There's also a, a code site where you can download all the code that runs all the examples that I showed today in the presentation. So that's all there. That's the Jupyter Notebook. You can go into that. Okay, so to wrap it up, I would like to say that uh, often uncertainty quantification is, is seen as a posterior analysis. It's like something you do at the end. And that's, I think, why well, I want to get rid of that idea. I think it's an emerging interdependency science where you look at physical sciences, but also data science, computer science, decision science, and as Ty said very well, human behavior. And that's where, where I think this field is going to go. And of course, we're looking for you, young, curious, and eager minds. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned you transform nonlinear non Gaussian system into yeah. linear Gaussian system. Doesn't it introduce another source of uncertainty to your uh, analysis? So that's, that's true. Uh, first of and then you can actually estimate that component. And then you can uh, figure out whether that component, that error, how big that is relative to other errors. So that component is calculated through bootstrap. That's a typical statistical confidence problem, right? You're doing a statistical estimation, and you would like to know a confidence on your estimation. So you can look at that confidence and say, what is that error relative to the uncertainty of your posterior? And it typically is, is very, very small, obviously, because there's so many uncertainties. If it's bigger, then you have to do a better transformation. Then you have to look at your transformation and filter out components differently. And, and so. Uh, we often work with PCA, and which is called, the other technique is called canonical correlation analysis, but there are methods like uh, uh, Niklas is working on deep learning methods to extract more and more of, the, of that linear variation out of the data. Yes. All right. Right, that's the same question as before. So uh, that requires a, the, cho the choice of the right machine learning method uh, to do that. And that's, that's a little bit of research, right? You can use uh, various forms of principal component analysis, which are like functional principal components, kernel principal components. There's many forms of principal component analysis that allows you to write that first equation, right? So a lot of research we're doing is how can we take uh, information and transform it into eventually this space. And it's been quite successful. I mean, actually, if you look at all the five case studies, they're mostly solved in, in eventually with a linear regression. So that's a little bit uh, the research uh, that, that goes into this. Yes? Um, what if you don't have a thousand wells, uh, 20 years of uh, history of heads and the yeah. concentrations? I mean, it seems to me that if you only have one seismic profile or yeah. one idea Well, then you have a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you can still learn. I mean, there's not much to learn, but you see, you have, you have, <laughs> they have a lot of uncertainty. So you start out with, it, it doesn't matter, this, this idea doesn't matter how much data you have, right? But if you have very few data, obviously, you're not going to reduce uncertainty much. But then how does that, compare? like, machine learning is to be really cool when you have a lot of data. No, well, okay. To, like, no, just Monte Carlo data. Monte Carlo data. So um, this is another point I think is very important to mention, something that is not recognized well. The dimension of the models is n, right? Hi. Monte Carlo generates information. 
ML models you generate through Monte Carlo. Have you noticed that this is... Why is that? This is, element, this is elementary, but extremely important to understand. Why do we generate few models that are high dimensional? Because you could say, if you're a statistician or a mathematician, you say, if you're in high dimensional space, you need to generate a high amount of models in order to understand that high dimensional space. Right? The reason lies in the prediction variable. The prediction variables we need to know are simple. How much stuff is there? How long does it take to extract it? How much can I extract over time? What is the temperature increase over time? In other words, these variables, they look like that, or we've seen a lot of plots like that this week, right? To quantify uncertainty on these variables, you need only few. How many? Suppose you want to calculate the probability of, say, a concentration going above some threshold. Right? What is the variance of this? If you want to estimate this empirically, the variance of that is simply that. How many do we need for that, for to estimate the probability? 100 to 1,000. You need to run only 100 to 1,000 runs in order to estimate a quantity of interest. That's why I'm saying we are not interested in, in revealing the complex total uncertainty on the models. We're not interested in that. We're interested in revealing, as Ty was saying, the purpose for which we're going to use the models. So in all, in all the cases that we do, we do this amount of runs. And it's Monte Carlo, so everything is parallelizable. Right? Some of these runs, like in that oil case, it takes half a day. But we can still do 1,000 because we just go put it on the cluster. And you know, for every 200 nodes, you get one run in half a day. That's, that takes five days of competition time. The problem with inverse modeling is it's iterative. You have to wait and wait. Monte Carlo is, that's the idea. So the, the amount of data is, is lies in, in this here. Right? That's the idea. Yeah. Oh, is, wow. Comparing uh, um, uncertainty estimation and also what kind of differing. And I question uh, is like, are you comparing two different things? And I mm. found two things that I, I okay. would ask you more about. It's about, isn't there a difference in how those two things integrate new data, like new measurement data? Mm -hmm. It would be like, uh, you've never asked for the color being here, and then you start doing this. And yeah. so, how, how would you deal with it? And the other one is, and you said that there is. Like in, in these methods, the prediction is or the predict prediction the variable. variable is easy, whereas the applications that I know from Osama Khanov, it's, it's actually a field of, of things, like many, many, many things you want to predict. So I think that's yeah. the difference. Is that right? Is that wrong? <laughs> Please answer. Yeah. No, no, I have a fair point. Um, so <coughs> what's going to happen? Oh, maybe I could do it here for here. So in the book, we talk about what is called sequential Monte Carlo or it's also called sequential importance resampling. So sequential importance resampling is the most generic or general way of updating uncertainties with, uh, with new information. The ensemble common filter is a derivative of that calculated under certain conditions of the forward model and, and the prior model. So you yeah, have to see that's already narrowing itself down to that. So that you have to be careful in, in in assuming uh, or using the ensemble combo filter. If you have new observations, what's going to happen? So now say I take an another tracer data, right? The only thing that's going to happen in this plot is what? That's not going to change. That's not going to change. This line is going to shift over here. And then updating just means recalculating the Gaussian distribution. So in ensemble common filter, this, there are assumptions being made on the relationship between D and H, right? You solve that into, into the real world problem, not into the, the, the transformed using machine learning linear uh, Gaussian problem. And so if you start doing that, when you start applying linear Gaussian methods, 
to nonlinear problems, you collapse uncertainty. So yes, ensemble and common filter is really good at following the data, but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, right? Ensemble and common filter does sort of like this, right? This, it follows the data, and this is your uncertainty that you get. But that doesn't make any sense to me. If this is the hurricane, right, that you're following, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me because now the uncertainty, if you map it back to your prior, you have an inconsistency. So what sequential Monte Carlo you should do is you start with a broad uncertainty and you keep narrowing it. That's the Bayes rule. So you have to start, Bayes rule says, you have to start with a broad uncertainty and then you narrow, 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 narrow. You cannot increase it. In probability theory, you cannot increase uncertainty with new information. So there are all these kind of things that you have to look really carefully into the theory of these methods as to what their conditions are under which they should be applied. <laughs> um, is this, to some degree, are you still limited in being able to find these outliers based on how you form your model? Yeah, absolutely. Are there ways to help people to, to do yeah. that? Yeah. So uh, that's an excellent question. So the biggest problem occurs, what you're saying is, if I uh, got the end, that's all. Uh, the biggest problem, which is the default that in all real cases happens, that I have worked with tens and tens of cases, is that their prior model is falsified. So then the question is, what do you do? So, the, so there's an imagination part to that, right? There's a, how creative, how, you were talking about it uh, earlier really well, is this, tr use models to improve your intuition, but also be careful with intuition. Intuition, that's what Kahneman and Tversky said, your intuition about uncertainty is really poor. If you would run these couple of tests, then you know, uh, you, you, it may not be well. So what we're doing now is do sensitivity analysis to figure out where in the model space you should be pushing, which parameters you should be pushing up higher, identifying bottlenecks in the, is it, was it the hydrological model? Was it the geophysical model? Was it, there, there is actually machine learning methods that can start to discover uh, which one of those you should be, be uh, working on. It doesn't tell you how to revise it. That's still a human component. There's no way around this, right? This doesn't take away the human. This makes your, you more special in a way or more important because it tells you here's your contribution. This is what you should be doing uh, in terms of, of, of this uncertainty quantification. 